If you haven't done so yet, make sure you pause the video and attempt to solve the question on your own first before listening on. In part A, they are asking us for the acceleration. And we know from Newton's second law that acceleration is going to equal the net force that's acting on the block divided by its mass. Now, of course, we are given the mass in the question, and in order to get a good picture of the net force that's acting on the mass, we're going to draw a free body diagram. So let's go ahead and do that. And so we've represented the block as this red dot right here. We know that the gravitational force acts straight down on the block, and then we have a normal force that's the result of the incline pushing back up on the block. So we can label this force Fn, and then the gravitational force will be Mg. And what we're going to do is define an x-axis that runs parallel to the ramp, so we can place it right about there. And then we're also going to have a y-axis that is perpendicular to the ramp, so right about there. Now we can see that the normal force points exactly along the y-axis, but the gravitational force is pointing somewhere between the x and the y-axis, which means that we have to break it into its x and y components. And so to do that, we're going to first draw the x and y components. And we can begin by drawing the y component. And the y component will point along this y-axis right here. And we'll notice that the y component forms an angle with the gravitational force. That angle will be marked as theta. And it turns out that that angle theta is the exact same angle as that of the incline. And so if we know that the straight down force is mg, and we're looking for the y component, we just ask ourselves, well, is the y component opposite, adjacent, or what to that angle right here? And we can see that's indeed adjacent to the angle, and that means we're going to use the cosine. So that y component is going to be mg times the cosine of the angle. The x component is going to point parallel to what we call the x-axis, which was that gray line right here. And we can see that that x component is opposite from the angle that we marked theta. And since it's opposite, we can use sine. So that component right there is going to be mg times the sine of theta. Now once we've broken up mg into its y and x components, we can actually get rid of the original mg force because we only want to concern ourselves with those components. It's also useful to take mg sine theta and sort of slide it up the y-axis so that it's pointing from what we could call the origin. So this vector right here will be mg sine theta. Now if we consider the y direction, we know that the block is definitely not accelerating either in the positive y direction or in the negative y direction because the block is simply sliding in the x direction. So there is no net force in the y direction. We can perhaps come over here and say that f net in the y direction is going to equal zero. However, in the x direction, we certainly have an acceleration. Why don't we go ahead and define this direction as the positive direction, and then this way will be the negative direction. And we can see that the net force in the x direction is this force right here, the mg sine theta. And so we can write that mg sine theta is indeed equal to the net force acting in the x direction. Now earlier we said that the acceleration is going to equal the net force divided by the mass. So we can take our net force of mg sine theta and we can divide it by the mass and indeed we'll see that the mass is actually algebraically cancelled. So the acceleration will just be g times the sine of theta. And so we could then plug in the value of g, which is, of course, 9.8 meters per second squared, multiplied by the sine of the incline angle, which was given to us as 30 degrees. And when we work that out, making sure our calculator is in degree mode, we'll get 4.9 meters per second squared, and that will be accelerating down the ramp. And so that turns out to be the correct answer to part A. Now on to part B, which wants the velocity of the block as it leaves the incline. And so we have redrawn the incline here. The displacement that the block is going to travel is basically going to be the length of the ramp, and we can just call that d for displacement. And if we look at this carefully, we can see that d forms the hypotenuse of this right triangle, and h would be the opposite of this right triangle, opposite from this angle right here. So of course the trig function that relates the opposite side to the hypotenuse is the sine function. So we could say that the sine of the angle is equal to the opposite side, which is h, divided by the hypotenuse, which is d. And what we want to do is solve this equation for d. And to do that, we can multiply both sides by d, 
so that it cancels on the right, and then divide both sides of the equation by sine theta. And so we can see that d is going to equal whatever the height is divided by the sine of theta. And now this is an important result because in order to calculate the final velocity, we can turn to one of the equations from kinematics, which tells us that the final velocity squared is equal to the initial velocity squared plus two times the acceleration times the displacement. Now this block is released from rest. That means the initial velocity, of course, will be zero. So that goes away. And then we can take the square root of both sides. So we would have the final velocity equaling the square root of two times the acceleration times the displacement. Well, we already came up with the acceleration, so we're gonna be able to plug that in. And then the displacement we just determined is the height divided by the sine of theta. Now we know the height is 0.5 meters and theta again was 30 degrees. So let's plug in all those known values. And when we carefully plug that into our calculators, we're going to see that the final velocity has a magnitude of 3.13 meters per second. Now, of course, velocity is a vector. And so we also need to come up with the direction. So let's come back over to the original diagram. We know that the block is going to slide directly off the edge of the ramp. And so once it slides off the edge of the ramp, it's going to be moving in this direction right here. This is our final velocity. We're going to need an angle. And to get that angle, what we can do is extend this tabletop horizontally, somewhat like that. And we know from geometry that if this angle is theta, then this angle right here also has to be theta. So that's going to be equal to the 30 degrees. And so we can express the final velocity as follows. It will be equal to 3.13 meters per second at an angle of 30 degrees below the horizontal. And we'll say it's below the horizontal by referring back to the diagram that we just marked up. And we can see that that red vector is pointing indeed below this horizontal line right there. And so this is the correct answer to part B. Now on to part C, which asks how far from the table will the block hit the floor? So we're looking for this value of R here. Now at this point, once the block slides off the edge of the ramp, it is now in free fall. And so the only force acting on it is gravity. And what we want to do in a free fall situation is actually make a little table that's going to help keep track of the information. In this table, we'll have the X and Y directions, as well as the initial velocity, the final velocity, acceleration, the displacement, and then the elapsed time. And to get a better look at the initial velocity, what we've done is we've redrawn it over here. So basically we're taking this picture here and we're sort of blowing it up so we can get a better look at it. We know that this magnitude of the initial velocity off the edge of the table is 3.13 meters per second. What we need to do is break that into an X component, which points to the right, and then a Y component, which points down. Again, this angle is 30 degrees. And since the x component is adjacent to the 30 degree angle, we would use the cosine function for it. So we would have the 3.13 times the cosine of 30. That's going to be the initial velocity of the block in the x direction once it leaves the table surface. Also, we have the y component, which is opposite to the 30 degree angle. So we would be using the sine. So we would have 3.13 times the sine of 30 degrees. Let's not forget that the initial velocity in the y direction is pointing down. So we're going to have to include a negative sign there. So this would be negative 3.13 times the sine of 30. The final velocity is not yet known. The acceleration in the x direction is actually zero because there is no force acting in the x direction anymore. The only force is gravity, which points in the y direction and it points straight down. And that causes an acceleration of negative 9.8. Now for the displacement in the x direction, we're looking for that. And we know that that has been marked as capital R, as we can see from the diagram. The displacement in the y direction is simply this height that was marked capital H. Now that's given to be two meters, but because the block is overall moving downward, we have to make sure that that displacement in the y direction is negative two meters. And the time interval is unknown for both the x and y direction. Now, it turns out that since we know a little bit more in the y direction, we're gonna fill in those information bits first. So let's actually find the final velocity in the y direction, and we'll show that work over here. And we know that in the y direction, the final velocity squared is going to equal the initial velocity squared plus two times the acceleration times the displacement. Now, we do know the initial velocity that was noted in the table, so let's fill that in. And then we have the acceleration in the y direction, which is negative 9.8, and then the displacement. We can pick up our calculators and simplify the right side. And then we can take the square root. And when we do that, we can see that the final velocity in the y direction 
gives us a value of 6.45. Now remember, when you square root a number, you technically get both a plus or a minus value. And we have to realize that since the block is moving downward, that its final velocity in the y direction will indeed be negative 6.45. So let's make sure that for that final velocity, we include a negative 6.45. Once we have that, we're going to be able to find the time. Because we know that final velocity is equal to initial velocity plus acceleration times time. Remember, we're working in the y direction right now. Why don't we solve this equation for time so we can subtract v initial from both sides and then divide both sides by the acceleration. And so here is our expression for the time. We'll go ahead and fill in the final velocity that we just found and we'll subtract the initial velocity and then we're going to go ahead and divide by the acceleration. And we end up with 0.499 seconds. So that's going to be the time in the y direction. It will also be the time in the x direction because those two times will always be the same. We can finally now solve for this value of the displacement in the x direction. Because we know that the displacement is equal to the initial velocity times the time plus one half times the acceleration times time squared. Now remember in the x direction we're calling the displacement capital R so we can fill that in. The initial velocity and the acceleration we can see in our table is 3.13 times the cosine of 30. We just figured out the time of 0.499 and then the acceleration in the x direction is actually zero as noted earlier so that's going to eliminate this term right here. And so when we work that out we're going to get about 1.35 meters. So that's the correct answer for the horizontal displacement or part C of the question, 1.35 meters. Now on to part D, which wants the total time interval from when the block was released, so from here, all the way down to when it hits the ground over here. Now, keep in mind, we've already found the time interval for when the block left the table and hit the ground. That was this 0.499 seconds. What we haven't figured out yet is the time it took for the block to slide down the ramp. But we do have some of the values. Let's recall that the acceleration down the ramp was equal to 4.9 meters per second squared. The initial velocity when we released the block down the ramp was zero because it was released from rest. The final velocity at the end of the ramp was 3.13 meters per second. So we can actually turn to this equation from kinematics and solve for the time it took to slide down the ramp. We'll solve for time, so we'll have V minus VI over A is equal to time, and then we'll plug in the known values. Perhaps we'll come over here and do that. So the final velocity of 3.13 minus the initial velocity divided by the acceleration of 4.9 gives us a time of about 0.64 seconds. So that's the time that was down the ramp. This is the time that was leaving the edge of the table. If we add those together, we're going to get a total time of approximately 1.14 seconds. Again, that came about by adding the two times together. So this is the final and correct answer to part D. And then for part E, does the mass of the block affect any of the above calculations? Well, you can go back and rewatch this. You'll notice we never use the mass of the block. So the answer to that last question is indeed no.